Welcome to worship today. I'm Katie Fast and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I serve as pastor here at St. Mark Lutheran Church in Dunedin, Florida. Welcome to our Good Friday Liturgy. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to pause this video and go and retrieve it. Open it to John, the 18th chapter, the first verse. Also, if you have a cross in your home that you might hold in your hand or set next to your chair where you sit, I invite you to go and retrieve that now as well. Go ahead and pause the video now. Life and death stand side by side as we enter into Good Friday. In John's Passion account, Jesus reveals the power and glory of God, even as he is put on trial and sentenced to death. Standing with the disciples at the foot of the cross, we pray for the whole world in the ancient bidding prayer, as Christ's death offers life to all. We gather in solemn devotion, but always with the promise that the tree around which we assemble is indeed a tree of life. We depart silently and we anticipate the culmination of these days in the dawn of Easter. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
Hello, welcome to Storytime with Pastor Katie. This week we're reading the story of Easter and we left off on Maundy Thursday on a page where, where Jesus had just, been, um, had just been taken away by some soldiers but, and uh, Judas, one of his friends, had told them where he was. So we begin today on a rather serious note um, about this story of Jesus. The priests who were angry wanted to get rid of Jesus. What will happen to us if people follow Jesus? They grumbled. So they took Jesus to the governor, Pontius Pilate. He would get rid of Jesus, they thought. Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus didn't answer. Pilate thought kings ruled over countries and people. Jesus knew that his power was about loving God. Even though Pilate didn't think Jesus had done anything wrong, he handed Jesus over to the angry people. The priest smiled. Soon Jesus would be gone. Jesus knew that he would die, but that wouldn't be the end of the story. Jesus knew God's plan too. It was a very sad day when Jesus died. The soldiers who had arrested Jesus teased him for pretending to be a king. They made a crown of vines with sharp thorns and put it on, put it on Jesus' head. The soldiers made Jesus carry a heavy wooden cross. Jesus fell and skinned his knees and the cross tumbled to the ground. A man in the crowd carried the cross the rest of the way. The soldiers nailed Jesus' hands and feet to the cross and raised it up on a hill between two other men. The other men were thieves who were being crucified too. One of the men was angry with Jesus. If you are a powerful king, can't you save yourself? Why don't you save us too? The man spat at Jesus. The other thief believed in Jesus. He shouted back, Why don't you know this is God's son? We are being punished for our mistakes, but Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. The man asked Jesus, will you take me to heaven with you? And Jesus looked at the man and loved him. Jesus said, yes, today we will be in heaven together. After a while, the world grew very dark, as if a terrible thunderstorm was coming. It was as if all of creation was crying because Jesus was about to die. Jesus felt all alone and prayed to see if God was still there. Of course, God never left Jesus. God was with him the whole time. Jesus looked at the crowd. He was so sad that people didn't believe that he was God's son. He asked God to forgive them for killing him. Finally, Jesus had fought for long enough he said, God, the work you gave me to do here is finished. He breathed a final, long, slow breath, and then he died. <sighs> How do you think Jesus felt in this story? Sad? Maybe mad? <laughs> Maybe disappointed? Maybe he hurt? a lot. This is a hard story for us to read and it makes me sad to read it. It's an important story for us to know the depth of Jesus' love for us, but it is a hard story to read. 
Have you ever been with somebody when they were dying or had a relative who died? It's hard. It's a very sad thing to go through. But we know that God is with us even in sad or really bad times. And we can pray and rely on God in that. So today, let's close in a prayer. And if you or your family want to read more about the story of Jesus' death, it's in John chapter 18 and 19. And I'd invite you to read it um, to yourselves and ask questions. Let us pray. Jesus, we are so sad. So sad that you died on a cross. We are so thankful for your love for us and for all people. We ask that you be with us in our grief. In your name we pray. Amen.
We come to today, to this Good Friday on April 2nd, 2021, with a long season of suffering behind us. To be really honest, reflecting on Jesus' passion at this point in our nation's history is really the last thing I want to do, especially in light of the many other passion narratives our collective ears and hearts have been forced to ingest. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, COVID-19 victims, and in these last few weeks, the victims of shootings in Atlanta and Boulder. The words of Psalm 31 seem tragically pertinent. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery and my bones waste away. There are too many among us whose strength fails and whose bones waste away because of grief sorrow, and misery. The infection currently afflicting the body politic migrates over into our actual bodies, which break down under the cruel and relentless assault of sin, death, and the devil. And yet, the story of Christ's passion that we hear in John's Gospel invites us to turn our eyes upon Jesus' passion and to meditate on this man of suffering on the cross. Julian of Norwich, known as one of the greatest English mystics who lived in the 14th century, wrote a series of revelations about visions she had while she lay stricken with the plague on her deathbed around the time of Good Friday, 1373. The eighth revelation, the heart of the book, concerns the passion and the cross, focusing on Jesus's pain and suffering. Is there any pain like this, she wondered? Of all pains that lead to salvation, this is the most pain, to see thy love suffer. How might any pain be more to me than to see him that is all my life, all my bliss, all my joy, suffer? Those who gathered with Jesus at the cross his mother, his friends and disciples, all lovers of Jesus, suffered pain at his death. In this community of pain, forged by the suffering of Jesus, Julian articulated one of her great theological insights. Here saw I a great oneing between Christ and us, for when he was in pain, we were in pain. To Julian, the cross was about oneing, the complete unity of God with us, and us with God, and not only us as humans, but she relates from the vision, the wanting of all creatures that suffer pain, suffer with him, and the firmament and the earth failed in sorrow, and the planets and all the elements and even the stars despaired at Christ dying. It seems then that the very experience of the passion reveals that Jesus not only suffered for us, but suffered with us. His death occurred for the wanting and love of all that was, is, and will be. The good, it seems this day, is in the with. In pain and suffering, Jesus is with us. In the journey of imprisonment and trial, Jesus is with us. What are you going through right now, dear people of God? What pain and suffering are you experiencing? I'd like to share a personal story with you that perhaps I've shared before. This was my greatest moment of physical pain, and it happened right after childbirth. I had greatly, I had gratefully given birth to a healthy baby boy and was in the recovery room with my husband and sweet newborn when I started to have intense pain. It came on very quickly, and it was obvious I was having complications. A team of medical personnel rushed in, my husband and newborn were rushed out of the room, and I was left with complete strangers in a scary and impossibly painful time. I didn't know what was going to happen or when the pain would stop. Through all the poking and prodding and diagnosing and IVs and everything, 
the doctors and nurses were doing what they were doing, I felt a hand grab a hold of mine. It was a nurse's hand. That sturdy hand felt so comforting and reassuring. For all you nurses, doctors, CNAs, your presence really does make a difference. That hand and a voice that went with it held on to me the whole time they were helping abate my pain and my complications. And that nurse didn't let go. She was with me that whole time. That was Christ. That was Jesus' presence. I am sure of it. And I can't help but think of all the medical personnel this past year who have risked their lives to be in the pain and suffering with COVID patients, who especially early on in the pandemic, when there weren't adequate supplies or not enough staff or we just didn't know enough about the disease, these heroes gave of themselves to not let go of people when they were in pain. And and then they themselves got COVID and some gave their lives. Their service was Christ's wanting with us and all humanity, being with us in intense suffering and even taking on our pain and responding with love and a stalwart presence that says, I'm never going to let go of you ever. I'm here with you. Dear people, my prayer for you is this, that Christ's suffering presence might be revealed to you, felt by you, heard by you, in whatever suffering or struggle you face. And let us all stand today at the foot of the cross and direct our gaze at the cross of Christ, where we see the clearest expression of God's love, compassion, and hope for the world. That truly causes me to tremble. Amen.
Let us pray, dear siblings, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the Church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Elizabeth Eaton and Pedro Suarez, our bishops, for Katie Fast, our pastor, for Connie Bonner, Klaus Koch, and Tom Osterfield, pastors in our congregation, for Jennifer Grumling, Ann Harmon, our seminarians, for all servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church and help us each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. Let us pray for those who are preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children and keep them in faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the world in the arm of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the advocate of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, we give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers. Free those unjustly deprived of liberty and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through our Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all the things our Lord would have us ask. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The cross is a powerful and meaningful symbol for us today. Perhaps you have a cross that hangs on the wall in your home, or perhaps you have one that you wear around your neck. Perhaps you have one as a bookmark in your Bible or as a background image on your cell phone. Wherever you encounter the cross in your everyday life, I invite you today to take a moment to pause and offer a moment of reverence for it. Reverencing the cross may include actions such as pausing before the cross, bowing, kneeling before it for prayer, or touching or holding it. I invite you to say the prayers that flow from your heart or to simply meditate on Christ's passion that we've heard today. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the world. O come, let us worship him. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection, for by your cross, joy has come into the world. May God be merciful and bless us. May the light of God's face shine upon us. Let your way be known upon the earth, your saving health among all nations. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection, For by your cross, joy has come into the world. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. May God give us blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. For by your cross, joy has come into the world. 